Welcome to this week's Socialist Party Facebook Live. Um, we're just going to spend a few minutes trying to check all the technology and build up the audience a little bit. I'm Sarah Sachs Eldridge, I'm the Socialist Party's national organiser and today I'm going to be speaking to Judy Beeshan. Judy is on the Socialist Party's executive committee. And the subject that we've chosen for this week is one of the big issues of the week actually. It's the exit strategy from the lockdown. Last night we heard Dominic Raab, who's uh, deputising for Boris Johnson, announcing an extension to the lockdown of another three weeks and also indicated that it could go on longer than that in some form or other. And as we know, unfortunately, the pandemic in Britain has not yet passed its peak and many people are going to be worrying uh, that exiting the lockdown too early is going to put lives in danger. And as we have made the case in our lives and in our uh, material, the socialist paper, Socialism Today, and so on, the danger to life is especially the case, given the woeful situation with regards to the government record on provision of PPE, on the mass testing, and also the criminal uh, uh, privatisation and cuts to the NHS and the austerity that came before, that have really rolled out a red carpet to COVID-19 to spread, especially amongst the working class and the poorest and the most vulnerable in society. And in fact, the exit strategy and these issues are things that we raise on the front cover of this week's socialist paper. Uh, you can see there, exit strategy, PPE and mass testing, workers' control of workplace safety. Um, and throughout the paper, actually, we are raising the call for workers' control for workplace safety. And there's some really excellent articles in there that I'd recommend you read if you haven't done so already, written by workers in the NHS, written by transport workers, written by workers in the civil service and retail. And they really do show that safety is not safe in the boss's hands and that over and over again, it is the workers in the workplaces, socialists and trade union fighters who have had to step in to call a halt to unsafe practices. So as I said, if you haven't got a copy, get online now and have a read, or not now, after this uh, live, uh, <laughs> and have a read of those articles. Share them with your friends, your family, your workmates. We think the ideas there are going to be useful for workers having to fight back. And that's going to be the case if you're in work, if you're working from home, if you're furloughed, if you're shielded, or whatever your situation now. The questions of how the working class uh, is organising against uh, the attempts by the bosses to prioritise profit over safety are really important. And that is why we thought it was important today uh, to start a discussion on what a socialist approach to the exit strat strategy looks like. Like everything, it cannot be left to the Tories and the boss class that they represent. We know where that will lead us. This morning, people might have been listening to the Today programme, like I was. There was a, a, they reported on the new campaign propaganda of the government, saying you know, that we're all in it together, the Tories putting that in loads of the newspapers today. But that came after an item, which was an interview with a working class woman in Detroit in the richest capitalist country on the planet whose water had been cut off for six months, not because of a lack of water, but because of pr private profit interfering with her access to be able to wash her hands and so on. So you can see just how important this question is of what kind of an exit strategy uh, we get. So that's why we're saying to people, if you can, before we get started properly interviewing uh, Judy, if you can share the link to this Facebook everywhere you can think of with people who might be interested, post their, you know, link, links to their names in the comments below. Let's try and build up the audience a bit for this really important uh, discussion that we want to have. And we also want to hear from you. If you've got questions about what we're raising, about what Judy's saying in the course of this interview, put your questions in the comment box or email us at info at socialistparty.org.uk. We want to hear from you. Um, and we'll get someone uh, to post the link, hopefully, uh, a Socialist Party member might do it for us, uh, of how to contact organisers in your region, in your area of the country, if you want to get in touch with the Socialist Party. So as soon as I get the OK from the tech side, confirmation that you can hear me, uh, and all of that will get going. And I think that's it now. So 
I'm Sarah Sachs Eldridge. I'm the Socialist Party National Organiser. Welcome to the Socialist Party's Facebook Live today. We're going to be putting some questions on the exit strategy to Judy Beeshan. Uh, Judy is the uh, uh, member of the Socialist Party Executive Committee and she's also a member of the International Secretariat of the Committee for a Workers International, the CWI. And the CWI is the World Socialist Organisation that the Socialist Party is affiliated to and you can find out more about that at socialistworld.net. Uh, socialist analysis, international reports from a working class uh, viewpoint and so on. And obviously the Socialist Party website is socialistparty.org.uk where you can read lots of articles about the things that we're going to be starting to discuss today. But without further ado, I'll start this interview with uh, Judy Beeshan. Hello, Judy. Hello, Sarah. OK, so just on to the lockdown straight away. Um, it's, it's clearly had an impact on reducing the spread of the coronavirus. But there is now increasing discussion and speculation on when the lockdown might end, with some ministers and shadow ministers being accused of placing the economy before people's lives. Is that the case, do you think? Well, of course, the government decided just yesterday to extend the restrictions for three more weeks. They didn't see it as tenable not to, uh, in reality. But I think there are plenty of signs that they are in increasing panic over what is a very rapid economic decline. And, of course, over a long period, you know, going back to the very beginnings of the Tory party, they have a long record of putting the motive of profit and wealth accumulation for the few at the top before people's lives. And we saw that really at the start of this COVID-19 crisis, where in Britain the government didn't want to close shops, pubs and so on. They wanted to keep the economy moving and allow the so-called herd immunity to develop. But there was an outcry uh, against that, as scientists were estimating that it could cause quarter of a million deaths. So they did a rapid U-turn, they brought in the lockdown, and uh, that's obviously a very recent example, really, of their, uh, it, the fact that they're inclined to put profit before people's lives. Uh, but you could look at many, many um, examples, really. You could look at the cold-hearted way that capitalist politicians view deaths when they mm -hmm. pursue wars that um, are at root, you know, about the economic issues of wealth and influence. And that comes first in those situations over people's lives. Um, it's been raised that one of the, um, well, one of the points that's been raised is that Boris Johnson was paid £25,000 by the Insurance Brokers Association. And that was just last year for a speaking engagement at the insurers' conference. So he personally had a lucrative arrangement with that sector and it was clear at the start of this crisis that the insurers didn't want businesses to be able to make claims on the basis that the government had ordered them to stop trading. So um, though, as I said, because of the out tremendous outcry that there was, the government saw that um, the death toll would be enormous if they continued on that line that the NHS would be overwhelmed as well because of the inadequate funding that, they've, um, that the NHS have suffered over a long period at the hands of the Tories and the previous Blairite governments as well and the, you know, all the cuts that Sarah mentioned in her introductory remarks. Um, so, and, and of course that's another example of the NHS of the way that pro-capitalist politicians put profit before people's lives because We've seen that in the creeping privatisation of the NHS, running it down as a publicly run service that can meet the needs of all. So why should we have any trust in their priorities now over ending this lockdown um, when their priorities have clearly never been in the right order uh, in the whole of history, really? Clearly, we shouldn't, as Fundamentally, the Tory governments are representatives of big business interests, as I said, as the Blairites were before them. And I think that um, 
it's clear that the reopening of businesses has to happen at some point, but what's needed is a policy that's best for the 99% in this country and not the wealthy few at the top. And that means that decisions need to be made on the basis of people's welfare, not capitalist interests. The question really is, from which class standpoint will these decisions be made? And as the Tories will make them from the standpoint of the ruling class, then it's also clear that they're not going to want any uh, transparency, any democratic oversight of their decisions. And, you know, just, just one last point on this question. I did notice in an article yesterday in a national newspaper uh, about the government's scientific advisory group that um, this is the group that's advising the government on what it should do. Uh, and even the names of the scientists on that group are kept secret, never mind you know, the evidence and the discussions that are taking place. So democratic checks and control are needed over the decisions about what happens. And I don't mean here, I'm not talking about particularly from the opposition MPs in Parliament, because most of them are cozying up to the Tories in the guise of um, needing national unity. But I'm talking about oversight from ordinary people, representatives from workplaces, trade unions, communities and so on, who can represent the, the genuine, uh, be the genuine representatives of the majority. Thank you very much, Judy. So I think that's been really clear, but what factors do you think the government should take into account when making its decisions on this? Well. One of the important factors clearly has been allowing the NHS time to get the necessary staff, equipment and wards in place. And that's been done to some extent, but without anywhere near enough protective equipment, as the NHS workers have been crying out for, enough training, and there's deficiencies on many other issues. And that is placing clearly a terrible strain on health workers who are risking their own health, who are working um, much, much too long hours. And many of them are low paid workers, of course, who should be paid much more for what they're doing. Um, so obviously the NHS being able to cope is a very important factor, but the lockdown is also about trying to stop people, especially the most vulnerable, from getting this terrible disease in the first place. So that is a crucial factor in the timing of what's to come. And really, the government is going to fail, I think we can say clearly, the government is going to fail to organise a return to work while minimising risk to vulnerable people because it's already allowed the virus to spread significantly with no mass testing and contact tracing system in place. And now, really, it's in a position where it's um, unable to fully catch up with... Um, that in the time scale it's got uh, of the duration of this lockdown. So it's not individuals who sit on park benches for five minutes who will be to blame for people getting this deadly disease, but it's the failures of the government. And incredibly, the Tory MP Ian Duncan Smith co-wrote an article that appeared in the Times yesterday in which he said uh, he was talking about the end of the lockdown, you know, how it should happen. And I'll quote him, he said, in any exit strategy, increased testing and tracing will be essential. And then he goes on, but we cannot wait for these to determine when we unlock. So there you have both a recognition that testing and tracing are essential, but an argument that restrictions should be lifted without them um, as far as they're concerned. So, um, you know, that, that says a lot. Now, Actually, uh, it won't be straightforward for the Tories to bring the economy back to life just by making any decisions, um, in fact, because, of course, we know that many businesses are already failing or are going to downsize at great cost to their staff. And it will be the case that there will be many workers who will not feel in a position to return to work when they're told to do so because of the risks to themselves and to other people around them and in society as a whole. And it's also the case that scientific advisers are telling the government that social distancing is going to have to stay in place, really, until there is um, a vaccine created and ready. And that could take a year or two. So it's clear that 
whatever the government decides in relation to the timing of the ending of the lockdown, that there's going to be um, an impact on the economy for quite a long time. That's, I think that's absolutely clear, as you said. But the other side of things is, is that the, the lockdown itself is causing great difficulties for many people, causing financial difficulties and difficulties in other respects. We've read about the issues of domestic violence and so on, but also including detrimental health consequences. And that has to be taken into account as well, doesn't it? Yes, it definitely does have to be, and it absolutely must be. There's nowhere near enough measures being taken either by the government or by councils to make sure that people can stay at home without detrimental consequences to themselves and in a lot of cases their families. Obviously there's people working from home who are under less pressure than they normally would be and are having a better work-life balance than they normally would. But on the other hand, there's uh, workers who have been laid off, workers who have been furloughed, workers who have got no work for other reasons mm. and are in tremendous financial difficulties and insecurity. And there's also many people who are in intolerable housing conditions, um, such as being enormously overcrowded. Mm. And then, you know, that's not to mention people that are homeless, of course, on the streets. And there's many other serious problems with this um, forced confinement that people uh, are in. For instance, um, you know, we could raise issues of, you know, loneliness, of boredom. But then, you know, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, an absolute nightmare situation of domestic violence for some. So we have taken up the demands that need to be raised in this situation in our workers' charter, um, this, this charter, which you can access at the top of our website. And I can't, you know, because of time now, go into all the points we make in that, but we definitely make the point that nobody should suffer financially due to the coronavirus. People must be guaranteed 100% of their normal wage and without any time delays in providing that, whether they're off sick, whether they're isolating or whether they're furloughed. And neither should there be any delay in people being able to ac access benefits. And we've raised in our charter that those benefits should be increased immediately to a wage that people can live on, um, which should uh, uh, immediately really be the, the minimum wage. And that also should be higher than it is. We make also demands on that. The councils should be taking over empty properties to ease the housing situation and if necessary using hotels to provide emergency accommodation where that's important to do. And there's much, much more that we raise in our charter. And by the way, I just add, it's, it's urgent that the government's furlough scheme is extended beyond May, which is when it's due to end at the present time, because there's employers at the moment who are uh, this week, the end of this week, giving statutory 45-day redundancy notices mm -hmm. um, in order to meet that end of May, end of furlough uh, time. So, you know, the, the government needs to tell those, those, uh, those companies and the workers who are furloughed that that scheme is going to go on beyond May. Absolutely. Those uh, demands and that programme really needs to be fought for. And there's probably going to be more challenges, isn't there? Because there's already much controversy around how the government might stagger the return to normal life, which parts of the economy and ed the education system would restart first. And uh, assuming that there is a, a gradual return uh, to, no to normal and that that will be less uh, risky than a sudden one, what should be done in that respect, do you think? I think um, it has to start with the scientific evidence looking at that and the thing is that's a moving picture because it's advancing all the time with knowledge on how the virus spreads and the best ways of countering it but there needs to be democratic oversight and decision making based on those findings of the scientists and having said that some of the possibilities for a gradual exit that are being reported in the media do seem ineffective or far-fetched, um, basically. For instance, you know, there's one of the points that's been raised is that perhaps different regions can be, um, have restrictions lifted. 
Um, it's so, so, you know, in one area they would be, in another area they wouldn't. But clearly there's big, big flaws in that plan because essential workers have to travel around the country and they're doing so to a, a large degree at the moment, in fact, to work in the intensive care units and so on. And many businesses that would open in one area uh, would need to have supplies from businesses in another area. So there's all sorts of uh, problems with that scenario. And then there's been other ideas like maybe that young workers between 20 and 30 could return to work first. And that really is a variance in reality of the government's initial herd immunity type of approach only applied to young people. And there's also been the issue raised of, well, maybe the school should go back first. And uh, Kian Starmer as well has been raising that issue. And of course, it's true that children are at relatively low risk from the virus, but that's not the same uh, situation for many of their teachers, many of the school staff, um, nor are many parents, uh, you know, there's many parents and grandparents, obviously, in particular, that are in vulnerable categories. So, um, you know, there's, there's all of those risks and a lot of parents won't be wanting to send their children back to school with that being the situation. And then any idea that young children can be made to socially distance in the classrooms and so on, in the playgrounds, is clearly absolutely absurd as the um, National Education Union um, wrote in a letter to Boris Johnson just recently. Uh, that, I mean, you know, to give you an example, I mean, you know, it, it, it does sound, you know, absurd and far-fetched, but, uh, but this is happening in some countries. In Denmark, half of the districts have reopening, are reopening their, their schools, but with teachers being told to keep the children away from having physical contact with each other, and also with the teachers being told to um, avoid having large groups of children together uh, at any one time. And you do wonder if these people putting out that kind of advice have ever been in a classroom in the recent period. Because, you know, it, it's clearly uh, any teacher would, would, would say of young children that it's, it's undoable. Uh, but of course, this issue links back to the government's keenness to minimise damage to the economy because they realise that parents are not going to be able to get back to work in large numbers unless their children are back at school. So it's a question of, you know, seeing schools partly as childminding facilities. And I think that teachers can justify, are justifiably um, angered and insulted by that approach at not being treated by the government as the highly skilled educators that they are and the professionals that are working around them. Um, I, th I think, you know, there's also the uh, perhaps more likely prospect that the government will go for um, getting certain sectors of the economy back first uh, beyond others. But that in itself wouldn't be at all straightforward because many workplaces uh, are not operating at the present time, not because they've been told that workers can't go into work, but because of supply chain problems and also, of course, because of problems with their customers, you know, the people that they're selling their services or goods to are not able to, to actually take, take that up at the moment. Um, and so the government can't just order those businesses and those workplaces back into operation, back into existence, when there's all sorts of other difficulties taking place. So it won't be a straightforward process, whatever the government does. And really, the government doesn't have any solutions on these issues. You know, it's, it's flailing about trying to find what uh, will be, you know, uh, the, the, the least problematic uh, solution for, for themselves, for their popularity um, and, you know, the way they're seen and, of course, as far as they're concerned, for the economy. I think that's absolutely clear. No clear solutions, but they do have a clear starting point, don't they, which is what you've highlighted throughout, that in all of these aspects of the lockdown and the response to the coronavirus crisis, it's a question of from which class standpoint decisions should be made and that brings me on to the last question for Judy today. So there's reports of in other parts of the world of, of workers returning to, to, to work like in, in Spain and being expected to do overtime, to not take holidays, to make up for lost working time. 
What would you say to, to workers facing that kind of situation? How can those workers stand up to those kind of demands? And what faces workers generally, would you say, after the lockdown exit? Well, firstly, that's presence. Uh, before the lockdown ends, I think it's necessary just to make the point that workplaces that are functioning, where there are workers in work at the moment, that um, it's important that they have functioning health and safety committees, um, trade union based if there's a trade union in that workplace, but you know, uh, definitely workers oversight in an organised form of the health and safety arrangements in those workplaces, cross union health and safety committees if there's more than one union in a workplace to make sure that the, because um, you know, there's bosses everywhere that are trying to get away without uh, having social how, you know, uh, uh, proper social distancing measures in the workplace, proper uh, decent hygiene standards and so on. And workers are having to, you know, take action on those issues. You know, we've seen walkouts already in parts of the country by Royal Mail workers who um, are objecting to the way that the bosses are trying to make them work without these basic health and safety minimal standards. And, you know, the workers, these committees need to be able to democratically meet and, well, you know, meet in a safe way, of course, um, and discuss the demands and actions that are needed in that workplace if um, those workers are not to be placed at risk. And also, um, I think we need to raise that before returns to work in workplaces that are not functioning at the moment, there should be agreements between the employers in those workplaces and the workers that are going back to work with their trade union reps or, or workers reps about the arrangements uh, for safety when they go back. You know, what will be the arrangements regarding social distancing? What, be, what will be the arrangements regarding, um, you know, the, um, the, you know the, the sanitary side of things and so on? And then there's many more points that in the Socialist Party uh, we raise. Uh, we've been saying as well that it's very important that the trade unions are functioning as bodies outside workplaces to give back up to the workers in the workplace, which does mean that trade union meetings on an area basis, um, you know, whether it's citywide, regional and national, should be taking place, or obviously online at the moment, not face to face, that's, you know, that's clear. But uh, for instance, Unison, which is the biggest union in the health service, uh, has actually cancelled. When the coronavirus, co coronavirus crisis hit, Unison cancelled its national and regional meetings. In the middle of this huge health crisis, where Unison members are facing incredibly difficult working conditions, so obviously, you know, as I've said and stressed, meetings have to take place safely. But if, for instance, the G7 leaders of the top economies, the top capitalist powers can have their meeting by teleconference, then, you know, big, big business is planning its strategy. Um, the top pol capitalist politicians are planning their strategy. So must workers' representatives in the trade unions be uh, having um, safe meetings as well. And also we've been raising that the national unions need to be prepared to take national action when it becomes necessary, um, which isn't unlikely after the lockdown situation ends to protect workers' health, safety, pay, terms, conditions, because there is a big danger that the bosses will use this coronavirus crisis to try to override normal workplace conditions and step up the exploitation. And also, this, the, the, you know, a similar argument could be applied to the government as well, because, you know, at what point is it going to start trying to recoup the money that it's spent, you know, the, the, the large amounts it's spent uh, on bailouts uh, to, to the private sector, of course, not just to um, ordinary workers and so on. Um, at what point is it going to start trying to get uh, working class people to pay for those debts, basically, through some means or other. So the unions have got to be ready to respond on these issues with a resolve that there will be no workers' sacrifices for the sake of the bosses' profits and no workers' sacrifices to save the capitalist system, basically. We 
um, he says in the editorial of The Socialist this week that we don't just need an exit strategy from lockdown, but um, we need an exit strategy from all the austerity, the poverty, the exploitation that this capitalist system is responsible for. And, um, you know, I just, in my just, you know, concluding remarks, just say that uh, for the working class to have that strategy, it's going to require the building of um, mass representation, political representation for workers with a so armed with a socialist programme. And that means a programme that includes taking into public ownership the key sectors of the economy, the major companies in society, and also bringing in democratic socialist planning of the economy so that there can be proper planning uh, linking up in a way that, I mean, we, we've seen the utter failure of the system to be able to prepare and respond to this coronavirus pandemic in a way that uh, has revealed that only a change, a fundamental change to a system of socialist planning could solve. Now, um, I think, you know, that there is going to be no return to normal as such after this pandemic um, and when there is an end of the lockdown because the economy has been hit so hard that it's not going to bounce back very quickly. Of course, you know, that once workplaces are up and running again, that there will be some increase in output and the growth rate. But how quickly the, gov the economy can recover as a whole is, is, is not clear yet. Um, and also people have been witnessing day by day the, the consequences of the government's failure uh, on to be able to counter this pandemic and what that means in terms of people's suffering basically the heartbreaking consequences that are taking place in the intensive care unit units and um, you know people's uh, losses at the present time so i think that the fundamental issue of how society and work should be organized is being discussed more and more and there is already a growing interest on a day by day, week by week basis on what a socialist alternative would be. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Judy. I think that was a really clear setting out of a socialist approach, a working class approach to, you know, starting this discussion on the uh, exit strategy from the lockdown. And I liked your phrase there, there must be no workers' sacrifice to pay for bosses' profits. That's uh, something to live by, isn't it? And if you agree with that, if you agree with that idea, if you agree with what Judy has been saying today, please share this video with other people who you think will be interested. Or if you found it interesting, please share it and discuss it with your friends, your workmates, people in your trade union branch. Please like our page, like the Socialist Party page. Judy has touched on loads of aspects of socialist ideas today. She's talked about the Workers' Charter. We, if you want to get a copy of that, get in touch, info at socialistparty.org.uk. We've got other material. I've mentioned the paper, the socialist paper. We've also produced uh, posters um, for people to use during the, the clap, the NHS clap on the Thursday evening, which has now become a bit of a, a solidarity protest against PFI, demanding PPE for NHS workers, demanding decent pay for NHS workers, and all workers, actually. Uh, so if you want some of that material, get in touch with us as well. I mentioned in the introduction that the Socialist Party is part of a world socialist organisation fighting for the socialist transformation uh, of society across the, the globe. And if you want to read more about that, it's socialistworld.net. The party website, the Socialist Party website, is www.socialistparty.org.uk and there you can find uh, the articles in the Socialist paper, reports from workers across uh, the country fighting for workplace safety against bosses putting their profits uh, first. You can also, on the website, find out about how to subscribe so you can get that paper delivered to your door or to your device every week. And we would welcome that because we think there's always valuable material in that. But obviously, as well, we welcome your financial support. And that's why I'll also ask 
as we have been doing in these uh, broadcasts for donations to the Socialist Party. Obviously the lockdown that we have been discussing today has had an impact on our ability to meet and to do our activity and it's through our organising with working class uh, members and supporters that we're able to raise the money to fund our party. We can't do that at the moment so we're asking everybody if they can contribute and support the running of a party to make sure that these ideas are getting out there, that it's not just this propaganda that the Tories are putting out, that we're all in it together, that is the only thing that workers get to hear, but it's the, the class, working class approach, the working class viewpoint and the working class ideas for struggle and organising. Read about the victories of bus workers uh, for safety on the buses, check out the Socialist Party website today for uh, new news on that, I won't break it here, but I can promise you that there's something worth reading about how a determined struggle by militant trade unionists, socialist trade unionists, has had a success in hopefully taking some measures that are going to make a difference to the lives of transport workers in, uh, in, in London. But if you agree with what we're saying, we want you to join us as well. We want you to join the Socialist Party. We want you to be part of us trying to build up this socialist voice, this voice putting forward an alternative way of running society as Judy has just outlined so well in this discussion. If you agree with what Judy was saying today, then join us. Get in touch. Uh, and we will put you in touch with uh, members in your area. You can join, obviously, an online meeting at this stage, but you could discuss all sorts of ideas in those meetings. But also organising, obviously organising in a safe way with social distancing and so on. But we want to, we're not just discussing ideas. We are fighting to get those ideas out there into the hands of the, the people, the workers, the young people who are going to need them now and going forward into the uh, uh, lockdown uh, exit uh, strategy as we have uh, discussed uh, today. So thank you very much for watching. We're aiming to be back again next Friday at one o'clock. Please like the page, share the video, get in touch and if you agree join us. Thank you very much. Thank you Judy, thanks for watching. <laughs>